conceived of in many, many ways. Many names, many theologies, many philosophies possible. They are all correct. Second, that is the goal of life and the goal of religion. Eat the mango. Don't quarrel about twigs and leaves. And Third, um, these are all different ways. The religions are the ways to take us to the goal. As many faiths, so many paths. And fourth, one must hold on to our, our way. It's, uh, it's a serious thing to hold on to something and make a lifetime practice of it. And then the fifth, while holding on to one very seriously, one has deep faith, reverence and love for all other approaches. One more point and I'll stop and we'll take questions. Um, see, there are different attitudes possible with regard to other religions. There's a whole spectrum. One approach is, it's called exclusivism. I am right, you're all wrong. And that can have two approaches. One is, I am right, you're all wrong. You go your way, I don't care about you. I just go, but I'm right, and you're all wrong. Or, I am right, you're all wrong, and I will bring you to my way. And that can lead to violence. Because I am right, you are wrong, it's a religion, is a serious matter. I am going to do good to you by forcing you to come to my way. So if I beat you, it's for your own good that I am beating you. Otherwise you will go and burn in hell. So I must not let you burn in hell, so I must. That's the ex called exclusivist. The second approach is called inclusivist. Inclusivist means that um, I am right, but you are also right. All the religions of the world also have truth, but I have the highest truth, the best truth, most inclusive truth. So your religious approach is part of my religious approach. The Vatican talked about the hidden Christians. So Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, they're all, um, there's truth there. They are uh, like Christians in disguise. Christianity is the truth, so you must come here, but it's not that your religions are false. It, there is truth in your religion. But that's an inclusivist approach. It's not in only in Christianity, in Hinduism also. So, my own tradition, my central tradition is Advaita Vedanta. Now, Advaita Vedanta can be very inclusivistic. How it can be inclusivistic? Yes, all paths are right. Bhakti, devotional approach, meditation, all of those things are good. But they are all helps. They prepare a person for the path of knowledge. Jnana Yoga, and you come to the path of knowledge, that will give you enlightenment and freedom. What about my bhakti, my devotion, or my meditation? Not directly. You have to come. There's an inclusivistic approach. And Advaitins are very clear about this. Those other paths are not wrong. They help you, but ultimately you have to come to me for, uh, for enlightenment. Gaudapada Acharya, in the Mandukya Karika, he talks about parasparam virudhyanti dairayam na virudhyate all the dualistic traditions of the world fight among each other but this non-dualistic tradition has no quarrel with anybody now why does this non-dualistic tradition have no quarrel with anybody uh, because Shankaracharya explains that we have no quarrel with anybody it's like a man riding on an elephant. Remember, he's from Kerala. In Kerala, there are elephants, lots of elephants. So, man riding on an elephant. And there's a madman on the street in front of him who says, Charge your elephant against my elephant. Let's have an elephant fight. Well, that's meaningless. He's crazy. He doesn't have an elephant. So, we have no quarrel with other religious idols because they don't exist. They're all appearances, part of Maya. That is not. That's not something that will be, that's very nice for our parents. <laughs> we have no quarrel with you because you don't exist. How can I have quarrel with you? The only truth is not duality, Advaita. From that Advaita perspective, everything else is an appearance. Can the water in the mirage have a quarrel with the dry desert? How can it be uh, water and yet be dry? It can be. If the water is a mirage and the desert is really dry. How can the same thing really be a snake and a rope? It can be, if it's really a rope and it appears as a snake. So the reality is not duality, everything else is an appearance. That's called inclusivism. And that's not very nice to others. <laughs> then there is a third approach, 
which is called pluralism, which is what religious scholars are trying to foster today. The, the truth is there in all religions and not higher or lower, not inclusive, need not be inclusive and uh, you can be free to follow your own religion. But there's one more movement, which is what I'll say and then stop, which is a new term called cosmopolitanism. Cosmopolitanism is not only is the truth in all religions, and they are all equally valid, they will all take you to the goal, but it's, you need not remain limited to your own religion. You can happily and you should learn from other religions and enrich our spiritual life. We can enrich our understanding, increase harmony, and enrich our spiritual life. We can be benefited. Our own spiritual life can become more powerful by insights from other religions. This is like cosmopolis. So, um, big city, where people from different countries come, different languages, uh, different kinds of food and culture, and you, you have, uh, you know, music from different places, food from different places. This is a sign of a cosmopolis, different languages. And you are not in your own little ivory towers separated from each other. Pluralistic, but no connection. No. There is interaction. What happens in a cosmopolis, in a big, one of the big modern cities of the world? We learn and we experience each other and our life, general quality of life is much better. Similarly, in spirituality also, there is cosmopolitanism. That, and Sri Ramakrishna fostered that. So this last uh, important addendum here, whenever he would see anybody practicing spirituality in any tradition, he would encourage them in their own path. And at the same time, he would also suggest very gently that be a little broader. And see, he tells the Brahmo devotees uh, who are a reformed sect in Hinduism, he said, look at the Vaishnavas. You need not worship Radha and Krishna like they do, because you don't want to. Fine. In Bengali, he said, Tabi Ode Tantukulav. See how much intense love they have for Krishna. Learn that. In your own ideal, you, you put that kind of intensity. So this cosmopolitanism. There's a new book, Swami Vivekananda's Vedantic Cosmopolitanism. It has just been launched from Oxford University Press, written by a brilliant young monk. I hope he will come here someday to speak. Um, Swami Medhananda. So he has this wonderful new book, Vedantic Cosmopolitanism. Swami Vivekananda's Vedantic Cosmopolitanism. Good. I am done. Now, let's, we have a little bit of time left. We can have a few question answers. How, how do we do that? Okay. Raise your hand. There's somebody, the, the volunteers will bring the, bring the microphone to you. Is that how you go? You bring the microphone to Yeah. There's a, a young man there. Tell us your name and ask the question. If it's not working, then just ask, I'll, I can hear you. Let's see if it's working. Say, say something. No? You can just ask. I can hear you. <coughs> Namaste, Swami. Yes. I, I, I've been listening to you for many years now. And uh, you're not only YouTube Swami, but you're a Spotify Swami as well. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a, I'm, I'm a family man. I don't get me time. Only time I get a me time is when I'm driving from work to home. And I have you with me in my car in Spotify. So, Thank you for all your, like, all your wisdom, and I listen to you so many, so many different lectures. Lately, I listened to your your lecture on Maya, and that was absolutely beautiful. And a few months ago, I listened to your one of the lecture where you talk about a religion, and you cited a study from UK where the the church participation is decreasing mm -hmm. and the reason that you provided is basically back in time there was a lot of difficulties. The society yeah, was not know. organized yeah. as society is becoming more sophisticated. Now you have no promise that religion is providing. Like there is no safety, there is no security that religion is providing. And in our Hindu belief, is there a parallel for religion? Because the way I 
I imagine the religion as the dharma, I have a set of beliefs. Is there a parallel that we can draw between a religion and our dharma, which is more of a karma based, which is more of a right. non expectation, no promise, nothing? Okay, I'll just sort of modify the question a little bit. Um, but first of all, thank you for your. Uh, you know, what you told, said about your driving and listening. A lot of people have told me that. And when the funniest incidents happened a few months ago, where this young man in California, he was driving me, um, to a, and, and he said, in, in Los Angeles, he said, I used to be an, an Uber driver, and I used to listen to your lectures. So you were always with me when I used to drive for, for Uber. And now you're actually sitting with me, but you're not talking about Vedanta. <laughs> so quickly, the study you referred to, I remember that. Um, that study, it says a very interesting thing. It says that, see, in ancient times, why uh, interest in religion is declining? So that's the point they made. Uh, in ancient times, very ancient times, uh, religion was uh, like a barter with higher forces. Uh, you know, life was difficult. Life was difficult. Um, you know, there was disease, there was uh, forces of nature, there were wild animals. And so you had to somehow please these higher forces, offer them something so that they will protect you, your children, your tribe, and so on. A kind of barter. As society became more organized and uh, you know, stable, there was rule of law, you don't have to go to God for that. So a civic society is there. But now religion has another role to play. That is, to sustain such a society, you need to teach people morals, an ethical life, a moral life, maintain the sanctity of the family, maintain the sanctity of society, you know, honesty and integrity and faith to each other, faithfulness, and all of these things. Religion was, that was the role for religion. Um, as civic society developed, also interest and faith in God diminished. Now you have these societies here in the United States, where I saw even more so in Australia, New Zealand, you, Singapore, you have societies where um, very stable, prosperous. Also, people are good in a in a post in a post enlightenment. And by enlightenment, I mean enlightenment of the Europe, where you are a good citizen. You are not good because religion has taught you to be good. You are good because it's good to be good. You want to be a decent person. Now, even religion is not required for that. You can have a nice society. You can have good people without religion. So the interest in religion is fast diminishing. That is the thesis. But then to that I added, now there is the real test, the real need for spirituality. You have a prosperous society. You have a more or less reasonably the things you could want in life. Society is going to give that to you. You are surrounded by more or less nice people. I mean, you might not think they are nice people. You might dislike your boss, you might dislike your neighbor. But they are not monsters. <coughs> they are they're not out to kill you, which in some parts of the world, it's still a problem. So you have a safe, good society, prosperous society. Now, one comes to see this is not enough. There is a vacuum within us, there is lack of fulfillment. We realize what Sri Ramakrishna meant by saying, having a bunch of zeros together. Still feel nothing. There is still old age, there is still disease and COVID, and there is still death. There are some final truths to human life which are still there. So, here comes the need for spirituality. There is something beyond material um, success and uh, having a good society where fulfillment is in the spiritual realm. So, spirituality will, will be the kind of religion that will be in demand as societies become better and more prosperous. It's not that religion will disappear. I think that's where Vedanta, Hinduism has a role to play. Yes, the gentleman here. Pranam Swamiji, I'm uh, Srini Gurabhu. I'm uh, the CEO of a technology startup. And with your uh, influence over the past three years, I renamed my company to Puma. After, oh. after your uh, talk and your advanced, and uh, we just launched the company. Um, I'm, a, I'm also uh, started a nonprofit called the 10YEC, which is a youth excellence center, which is 
predominantly to cultivate the entrepreneurial and excellence mindset based on yogic powers at um, And you've been a great, great influence for that. In fact, we incorporated Vihala Flow, Kaizen, and some of those things. But coming back to the question about the religion, as, as you rightly said at the beginning, the youth today has a, particularly children of the Indian descent, people have a tough time grasping the, the multifaceted Hinduism. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is where we need a modern interpretation. So one of the discussions that I've had is, in the past, religion was serving multiple roles. One, it was serving the role of science, the, how, the governance, how to group people together. And then the third one, third one is the moral values. And the fourth one is to go realize the vastness, the, the God realization. Is it time for us to reform or going back to our original religions to seed some aspects of governance to, let's say, democracy and science to uh, you know, seed the different aspects to what is commonly perceived and then stick to the primary thing, which is about moral values and the, and the infinite re realization. Until that happens, if you were to take all of it, it forms conflicting, like what you said, you know, science and the current values need to be incorporated. So that's, that's an inquiry, and thank you so much for everything that you do for us. Short answer, yes. <laughs> Certainly, the core of religion which is spirituality. That needs to be stressed, and there's a demand for that. There isn't so much of a demand for a theocracy, a religious government. There isn't so much of a demand for the, um, religious explanations of the universe. Science does that. Our secular societies govern uh, our, our countries. So religion should do, like any management expert, you can say that, do what you are good at. So religion should do what it is good at, which is transcendence, which is spirituality. And um, congratulations on Bhuma. Bhuma means the past. So he has named his company Bhuma. <laughs> Good. The microphone there. And we'll, is there anybody on this side? The two people. We'll go there and end. Tell us your name and ask the question. My name is Sunya. Uh, you are also my commute story as well. Thank you for all your podcasts. not really very interested in spirituality or religion and how the popularism is going now. Uh, in the modern world, what do you suggest we do to make sure that uh, people who are not at that level of mind blown hierarchy, so to speak, uh, we can still have connection with those people who are still in the lower rounds uh, while trying to find uh, Brahma? True. This was something that uh, Vivekananda emphasized. He said, that Vedanta, or in general spirituality, it's not only for just for monks in the Himalayas. He said that which was limited to a few scholars and monks, that which was in the forests and the caves, I shall scatter it worldwide. I'll bring it, I'll bring the philosophy from the forests to the cities. What does that mean? It's not just for a few mystics, it's not just for a few monks. In fact, people in the world, they really need this philosophy more than anything else. Monks, I have it easier. It's people in the, in the society, in the family, uh, in holding jobs and responsibilities uh, out there. They need this and I can see how it can really help people. Um, your question also, let me just add, you asked a question about the next generation of children of Indian immigrants. How to explain Hinduism and especially the core of Hinduism. Vivekananda is a one word answer. Sister Nivedita writes in an introduction to the complete works of Vivekananda. In these works, in the pages, in these pages, for centuries to come, the Hindu man who would find meaning in his religion, what is the meaning of Hinduism? He will search here. The Hindu mother who would teach her religion to her children will search here. How to put it in a you know, the essence of Hinduism, an essence of spirituality, in a way that is acceptable to a modern generation. Yes, there are two ladies there. Hello, my name is Rushmita. I'm really thankful for the talk. I have one uh, small kind of uh, question.
question I want to get your sense. That is, in the beginning you started the today's session by saying the, the acceptability in Hinduism about uh, the many ways of doing it, the general acceptability. So how would you account for the strife and the kind of um, hatred or the kind of tendency that we see back home? Uh, is it due to the exclusiveness or the inclusiveness nature that you just mentioned in the latter part of your session? Or how do you give an explanation to that as you know, me coming to from India almost 25 years back and what I see now and how we were raised at that time, I see a quantum difference and the kind of sensitivity and heightened attitude that we see in the population. Uh, how do you account for that still being a predominantly Hindu country? Yes. So I was in this talk show in Fargo and in the talk, radio talk show and they said, the radio talk host said, you are the first Hindu monk we have ever seen in this part of the country. And when I talked about the harmony of religion, he said, look, the little that I know about the history of India and subcontinent, in one sense you have to say it's a failure because the country was partitioned on the basis of religion after all. Now I will only say this much, that what we see now is a society in fast transition. And I think the general direction is good. It, it, it will not come to any serious harm. It's just evolving and things will settle down at a better level than they were earlier. As far as Hinduism is concerned, I'd like to point out that, which I pointed out to the talk show uh, host, is that there is no basis in Hinduism for violence against other religions, for hatred of other religions. Which, tell me, which, which text, which text, which scripture, which Gita Upanishad, where? Tell me, which teacher in the whole tradition of Hinduism, sitting for thousands of years, which spiritual master has preached violence against other religions or even hatred of other religions? No, none of them. Never. So there is no authentic basis for hatred or violence in the texts or the traditions or the teachings of Hinduism. What you see now is more of a reaction to um, real and perceived uh, incidents in history and also today. So there, what has happened is, look at the, you can reduce the volume on that one. So there what has happened is, one, for example, one right-wing uh, thinker, very well known, I will not take the name, he said, you all this thing you talk about, Vivekananda, Ramakrishna, harmony of religions, what is the use? Are other people listening to you? Are other people listening to these teachings and other religions? So I said to him, two points. One, first, as Hindus, we must say this. This was my whole thrust within the but in this talk. What can we give to this world? We can authentically share a tradition which has a, a, thousands of years of harmonious living together. This is something really worthwhile. So this is what we must um, we, we must tell the world, and we must remind ourselves of it also. I told a gentleman, whatever you are saying about what other religions have done against Hindus. All of that is true, and I admit it, it is true. It, it, one need not be foolish, one must be wise about what, what world you are living in. After all that, you are still a Hindu, isn't it? Yes. So from your tradition, what is your response to other religions? It still has to be that ekam sadhviprava dhavadanti vasudeva kutumbakam. One example I will give you is the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan Buddhists and their reaction to Chinese oppression, for example. So they did not, um, you know, imitate the oppressor. Rather, when their reaction was to go back to their tradition, Tibetan Buddhist tradition, strengthen that, keep, um, foster it among themselves, and spread it across the world, and respond from that perspective, which is why they are so highly respected across the world today. Similarly, as a Hindu, you and I, we must respond from the Hindu perspective like our forefathers have done for thousands of years, without being foolish, without being ignorant. Uh, so this was point one which I said to them. Second, that question they asked, is it any use, is anybody listening? Yes. Uh, when Swami Vivekananda came to this country in 1893, Parliament of World Religions, um, a World Parliament of Religions, 
at that time it was common for people to say, my religion is right, everybody else is false. It was an accepted kind of thing. Nobody thought twice about it. From the pulpit itself, from the uh, stage itself, people would make speeches about the rightness of my religion and the falsity of all others. The Bishop of Canterbury, Anglican Bishop, uh, he refused to send a representative for the Parliament of uh, Religions because why? How will you put me on the same platform with all false religions? I will not. <laughs> now that was common and accepted at that time. Today, a hundred years later, if people speak like that in public, in uh, to the world audience, you'll be laughed off the stage. You'll be regarded as an uncivilized, uh, as uh, uh, you know, uh, uneducated, low-class kind of person. People still say those same things in their own congregations, political, you know, or narrow-minded. But even those people who are narrow-minded can't easily say it in, say, an open congregation like this. That is a very big ad uh, advance in 100 years. It shows we are going in the right direction. So that is my point. Yes, that lady and, and then that lady. Just make it short, we are running out of time. Hi. My name is uh, Pradeep Tamukherjee and uh, thank you Maharaji for coming and blessing us over here in Austin. It's an absolute pleasure to have you among us. I just want to uh, make an extension to what uh, Devishmita just said, right? Uh, do you think for harmony of religion and harmony of society, there should be a true separation between religions and politics? Yes. Because the more I see... The okay, I'll well, just um, deal with that. A true separation of religion and politics, that's the very ideal of a secular state. Exactly. But you know, if you ask me, yes. But, you know, someone no less than Mahatma Gandhi, he was accused of doing politics in... Uh, re um, relig religion in politics. And his, his answer was... His answer was remarkable. The answer for the ages. He was accused. Why are you doing introducing religion into politics? His answer was, the two greatest forces of human good that I know are religion and politics and as long as I live, I shall not cease to do politics in religion and religion in politics. <laughs> <laughs> but that was in a very enlightened way. So, what answer can I give you? As far as we are concerned, in the Ramakrishna Mission and monks, we are very clearly, it is a directive from Swami Vivekananda onwards, we will have nothing to do with politics, even good politics also. Not for everybody, just the monks of the Ramakrishna order. It's not that he was against politics. Sister Nivedita herself, she was at the very, one of the major forces behind um, the nationalist movement in Bengal. So, she was pretty much in, uh, involved in politics. But, as monks, of course, we are very clearly told not to have anything to do with any side in, in politics. So, that's, uh, so that's not a straight answer, but that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> then, the last question is from there. I think I've brought up uh, yeah, yeah, Swamiji, my name is Vandana and I've been coming to all your lectures in Austin and actually the lady in front of me has pretty much answered the question that I had uh, which is, uh, you have, because I, I listen to your lectures, I, I think I've listened to all of them on YouTube and you had said that on YouTube also that you think there were no religious wars in India and that was going to be my question, uh, that we've had so many wars. So, I think you pretty much answered that, but... That was big, after the coming of exclusivist religions. That's why we are there. See, um, if the problem is primarily coming from the other side, you don't have a full capacity to solve it. You can say, you can take an enlightened position and teach that. And hopefully, that was Swami Vivekananda's hope, that people will absorb this. And it is happening over time. Slowly happen. Alright, on that very hopeful note, let me do a Shanti chant and stop. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri 